As you heard from that highly produced introduction, so flattered, uh, John Carney filling in for McGraw. I'll be filling in for myself tonight. Double duty today, so join me tonight for the Carney Show. Gary Wright, the guy that gave us Dreamweaver, Love is Alive, 70s electronic synthesizer rock, and glittery eyeshadow on a man was okay. Those were different times. So that's tonight. Also on the program, Tom O'Keefe talks movies with us and um, listener games. So let's finish the day thing, shall we? Very excited about this. Uh, Ray Fesquith with us and a new book, Real Talk for Real Teachers. Um, Not his first foray into writing, Teach Like Your Hair's on Fire, his last one that turns a lot of heads and also a New York Times bestseller. He's in town, a book signing set for MICDS. Coming up tonight, we'll give you the details on that and how to get your tickets. Uh, it's at 7 o'clock this evening. And, Ray, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I, so much has been uh, said about you and your education style and your students and where they have gone and what they have done with their lives. But let's talk about Rafe as a kid. Is this overcompensation for bad <laughs> teachers and a crappy education for you? No, I had a wonderful education. I'm a product of L.A. public schools, went to UCLA. I bleed blue and gold. Yeah. Uh, one of my great moments was John Wooden actually had breakfast with me because he liked what I was doing. Right. So, no, I had a great childhood. I had great parents. But when I saw, when I became a teacher and saw the mediocrity of public schools, I became angry, and I decided to make some changes uh, in the way we teach our children. I've had a lot of luck with it. You hear of a lot of teachers expressing the same frustration, that budget cutbacks or whatever, and they're paying for school supplies for their kids out of their own paycheck, or they're getting burned out, or their district is being closed or reshuffled or consolidated. So how are you able to say what a lot of them have felt and make a difference on such a grand scale when many have not? Well, that's why I've written Real Talk. I'm really putting this book out to try and bolster my colleagues' spirits. John, there's a bitter joke going around among teachers right now, and here's what they're saying. Those who can teach and those who can't make the rules for teachers. (laughs) And teachers, I really feel that good teaching has become almost an endangered species. Because our best teachers are leaving the profession in droves now, not because of the kids. And you were talking to me before, not because of the money, not because of reaching into their own pockets. It's the system itself that's crushing them with absurd amounts of standardized testing, absurd rules and regulations, which prevent teachers from creating their own classrooms. And I've, in this book, tried to show how I've quietly rebelled against the system and been able to stay strong by doing things my way and not letting the system push me around. Has it been all that quietly? You're New York Times bestselling author. Oprah's done some stuff with you. You've got awards from saying, everyone but, you've but heard you of. But you have to understand, in my school, I'm very quiet. I have a chapter in the book called The Quiet Man. I know a lot of good teachers who fight the system. I understand their frustration. But my philosophy is you can win a lot of fights without firing a shot. I don't argue with people when they have these horrible staff meetings. And the teachers listening know what I'm talking about. I just sit there and I nod my head and smile, thank you very much, and then I go back to my classroom and quietly do what has to be done in the best interest of my students. Why aren't you the Secretary of Education? Well, because I'm a public school teacher and I have the best job in the world. Why would I leave that? Because you might be able to make more of a direct difference faster? Well, I think by having people visit my classroom and hearing what I have to say, I am making a difference because I hear from thousands of teachers all over the world who are doing some of the things I'm suggesting they do, and they're having a lot of fun in the classroom. Now, talk a little bit about your class, room 56 at Hobart Elementary School, and it gets referenced all the time. I would think there is a waiting list of people that want to get their (laughs) kids in your class. If I told you behind the scenes what parents have offered me to get their kids in the class, I mean, literally, money, drugs, sex, the whole bit. But I'm a public school teacher, so it's random, and... I do an after-school program that's very well-known where the kids produce a Shakespeare play every year. Yeah. And all the kids from the school in the fourth and fifth grade can come join it. So I work with like 100 kids after school. Right. And I, wanna, I really want to stress this. You know, when you open up the paper or listen to the radio, you hear these horror stories of teachers. And I'm the first one to tell you there are terrible teachers out there. We've all had them. But there are also wonderful teachers that you never hear about because they're busy doing their job. And I work with them. And they helped me tremendously at Hobart School. And part of the themes of this book is don't do it alone. I collaborate with some really good educators 
to have produced this wonderful place called Room 56. And if you talk to anybody about the influences in their life, there's going to be at least one teacher in there. My memories of the teachers that push me to be creative, that push me to to talk more, um, like I needed more prompting to talk more, <laughs> which was actually kind of funny. Um, I, my memories of those individuals are more clear than any girlfriends I had. Absolutely. One of the, the points of this book, there are a lot of teachers sometimes who feel they're not making a difference or they haven't reached somebody. They don't really know that because I get letters from students from 30 years ago. This is my 31st year. Kids who I didn't think I'd reached, who write me letters that they're doing real well in their life, they're happily married, they're still using the lessons that I taught them, and we make a huge difference. We just don't always know that. That only happens in the Hollywood movie, John, You know where they hear right. the music. And this is a real book. This is real talk for real teachers, pointing out that not all children are golden drops of sunshine, that sometimes as teachers we fail and we don't reach children. It happens to me all the time. But that we can't give up because there are too many good students waiting for us to open doors for them. As parents and as students, is this something that we would also find helpful or is it strictly based for those that lead academia? Well, as a father of four, I certainly hope the parents will be reading it. And one of the key themes of the book that parents can talk to their kids about is there's a simple exercise I do with my children that's very effective, and I did it with my own children as well, which is if you go to a kid in school who's working on math or working on science or whatever, and you ask him, why are you doing this? What do you think the kid will say? He'll say, because my teacher told me to. It's an assignment. Right. If you ask one of my students, why are you doing math? He'll look you in the eye and say, because if I learn this skill, my life just got better. Every skill that I teach, I show them the relevance of that skill in their life. And I think that's the conversation we all have to be having with our children. We're not here to pass a test. We're not here to get an A. Those are wonderful things to do. But the real thing is to learn skills that will be useful and relevant to us. By later in high school, by college, we've already experienced some rejection. We've experienced some failure. We've experienced competition. So saying that by doing this now, it will help you later. The concept of later we get, but go to third and fourth grade and, and, and your kids are even younger. I've got, I've got a three and a four year old. How do I explain to them, look, by doing this now, you're gonna be in jail That later. is a wonderful question and I have a wonderful answer for you. There's a chapter in the book called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. And here's the great secret to the success of my classroom. Because I've done this for a long time, and because I've stayed put, I have an army of former students. Every day, John, kids from high school and college come back and return to say hi and talk to my younger students. When my little ones see those kids, that's the vision where when they hear, oh, people don't care about school, my kids go, you're crazy. I've met kids who are five years older than me, six years older than me. They're really doing well. They're really happy and excited. I want to be like them. And I really encourage teachers to reach out to their former students to show their younger ones the product that's possible. Ray Vesquith with, the, with us and Real Talk for Real Teachers, advice uh, for teachers from rookies to veterans. The book is now out in a book signing and a talk tonight at MICDS on Warson Road. That'll be at 7 o'clock, and you can get tickets uh, by going to realtalk.brownpapertickets.com. Um, $30 gets your ticket, but also a copy of the book, which is now available as well, and probably already a New York Times bestseller, is it not? It's coming. Yeah, and the first one, uh, Teach Like Your Hair's on Fire. That Was that the first foray into this Actually, for you? that was the second. This is my fourth book. Right. But um, I think it's the book that's the most necessary one. Teach Like Your Hair's on Fire was, was what we do in Room 56. Right. This book is why we do it. Who's going to play you in the movie? Uh, it's funny. I've been offered it many, many times. Yeah. I will not allow that movie to be made. Why? Because Hollywood movies lie. And in ho the, one of the things that people like about this book, it's an honest book. Hollywood movies always have the teacher save every kid and they cue the music and they, they all win the big game at the end. That doesn't happen. Right. Um, real teachers fail. And there's a line in my book, teaching hurts, get used to it. Because, <laughs> because every good teacher I know, believe me, we have sleepless nights and, and fretting over a kid we, we have failed with. But I want the young teachers to know when they're discouraged, you know, Rafe's a pretty good teacher, 
And if he can fail all the time, it's really okay if I fail too, as long as I try to learn from my mistakes. And you talk about Hollywood not being real life and that, you know, not everybody catches the, uh, you know, uh, touchdown pass to win the game at homecoming. But also along that line, every teacher who has your passion doesn't end up on the New York Times bestseller list or radio tours or all of that. Not that this is why you do it, but why is it that you are where you are and the other committed teachers are are just just mired in their classroom and frustrated? Well, listen, I'm frustrated too, and I don't think I'm in any better position than those teachers are. Believe me, my favorite place to be is room 56. There's no question about it. Anybody who knows me, my students are always around. We travel constantly. So I want to make sure those teachers know they don't need to be mired. They are surrounded by other great teachers. You've got to look to them for your support because if you're looking for society to give us our thanks, that's never going to happen. Among other things, my father handed me over to uh, priests at some point and said, you know, I don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> And I remember him telling me clearly, I'm sending you here because they're allowed to hit you. Uh, and each priest had their own form of torture, whether it was a class <laughs> ring or an eraser or a yardstick or beatings of various and sundry. And a lot of people will say that's part of the problem because you can't discipline the kids. There's no fear of repercussions. You know, like, well, if, you know, if you don't give me an A, I really need an A here, I'm going to go tell mom and dad that you hit me or worse, tried to sexually abuse me. I think teachers are shackled along those lines. Oh. What, what do you think about that? Well, here's my, my answer. The reason we don't have discipline problems in my class, first of all, I would never hit a kid. I never hit my own kids. Oh, uh, I recommend I, it. It's a great stress reliever. I got to well, tell you, I got four of them if you want to come over. Uh, yeah. For me, John... <laughs> the first rule of teaching is that I have to be the person I want the kids to be. And I don't want my kids to hit anybody, which means I can't hit anybody. I want my kids to be nice. That means I have to be a nice guy, even on days when I want to throw them out the window. Okay. Did you have teachers that disciplined you physically? I didn't school? have to. I was Did a good you get kid paddled in school. or anything? No, I was a good kid in school. We wouldn't have met each other. I'm pretty I was, sure. I was a very good student. I was the kid who the other parents said, Why can't you be more like Rafe? He's such a nice little boy. <laughs> I, I was that kid. Probably, it's probably why I'm such a smart ass and a rebel now because I'm making up for making lost up time. for be, being the little angel as a child. Yeah. But but the serious point is the reason the best way to avoid the discipline problems is my classroom is so much fun and so exciting that there's only one punishment. If you're, for example, being a bad sport during baseball, you don't get to play baseball. And the punishment is they want to participate. So. I'm more, uh, I'm more of a proactive teacher than a reactive teacher. I create situations that are so much fun that today we're building rockets and the kids want to build rockets. That's why they listen. That's why they play by the rules because the lessons are exciting. Most kids act up in school because they're bored. And if you look at the rules and regs thrown at teachers today where their whole day children spend getting ready for a standardized test, they're bored to tears. Somebody somehow in the powers that be have decided that the regurgitation of facts on a, on a Scantron sheet passes for scholarship and learning. It doesn't. And I'm trying to speak up for all the teachers who know we have to do better than a standardized test. Ray Fesquith with us, and the book is Real Talk for Real Teachers, book signing at MICDS tonight at 7 o'clock. To get the tickets, go to realtalk.brownpapertickets.com. Pick them up there, and your cost of entry includes a copy of the book as well. Do we need a break or can we keep going? All right, let's take a quick break and we'll keep you for a few more minutes. I Thank know you. you've got some other things to go. Um, John Carney filling in for McGraw Millhaven. I'll also be back tonight with the Carney show at, uh, well, about 11 and a half hours from now. So you get plenty of me. <laughs> Hang on. We'll be back in just a moment. Hello. Rafe Esquith and his fourth book is out. It's called Real Talk for Real Teachers, Advice for Teachers from Rookies to Veterans, a book signing and a talk tonight, class in session. MICDS out on uh, Warson Road, realtalk.brownpapertickets.com to get your tickets. That will be at 7 o'clock sharp, and attendance will be taken. So, again, what a pleasure to visit with you. I really appreciate it. It's just fun to meet so many great teachers around the country. And do you get to spend much time with educators? Or is oh, that my gosh, a big yes. portion of the people that show up at your... That's your, the fun. Your groupies? You know, my groupies. You know, I was in China recently, and I had to have bodyguards because the teachers stalk my hotel 
They're, the China, You know, the funny thing is, in the other countries, you think we're so different. John, they're dealing with the same problems we are. Right. It's exactly the same. And it's fun meeting <sighs> teachers all over the world. And they're really good. Okay, not a big supporter of standardized testing from a couple of things you mentioned. So how do we gauge education on a whole right. and how we're doing? Well, first of all, I, I don't know a teacher who doesn't assess his kids. I assess my kids all the time. But let's make two points clear. First of all, our standardized tests are not standardized. They are administered by the teachers in their classrooms. And you must know there are cheating scandals all over the country right now. So if we're going to do standardized testing, let's at least proctor it so that the data we're looking at is accurate. This happens all the time. I get kids in my room whose scores show me their advance in math from the fourth grade. And then I look at their math and they can't even multiply. Clearly, their test scores are not accurate. Yeah, That's one of my problems with standardized testing. But I also think we have to remind everybody that's a snapshot of the child. Those, those tests don't ask if the kids are honest what their laugh sounds like. I always joke with my students that my wife didn't fall in love with me because she looked at my test scores. So let's just put the testing in perspective. Of course we have to test our children. Let's just not make it the be all and end all of existence. Indeed. My girls went to a school called New City, New okay. City School, which has a national reputation and they've implemented an educational program that in my estimation needs to be used even more. And it plays up to the strengths of the kids what they're really interested, what they're good at. Fantastic. And that's where their focus is, as opposed to, here's what we teach, get on right. the bandwagon, or you need to go somewhere else. And John, what we're teaching keeps getting smaller. We keep shrinking the menu. At my own school, we just lost our librarian and our orchestra. So as the men, you know, I always tell people, if you walk into a restaurant, the more things that are on the menu, there's a better chance you're going to find something you want to eat. And I love what this school is doing, because what I've done in my classroom and what I'm suggesting in this book, there's a chapter called The Undiscovered Country, where every year I add one thing to my classroom, just one. And what happens over many, many years, all the kids come to school knowing there's going to be part of their day that they love, something they're looking forward to, whether it's science or baseball. This year, believe it or not, I'm going to teach my kids how to play the bagpipes because... Parents are going to hate you with the homework assignments. Uh, actually, I don't give homework. <laughs> um, I'm not a homework believer either. Um, but no, what happens is we do a Shakespeare play every year and there's a scene in Scotland. So we're going to have kids playing the bagpipes yeah. and the kids are going to do something new. Why is there still Latin being taught? Well, Why I, is I, geometry, if you're not going to be an architect, being see, taught? See, I think Latin is fantastic as an option. Geometry is fantastic as an option. I'm completely with you. Um, what I do with the kids all the time, I, you know, people are shocked by this, but like we have this fantastic Shakespeare program, but it's an option. Maybe right. you don't want to be in the Shakespeare program. That's fine. It's fine. That's my job is simply to open doors. But it's the children's job to decide which ones they want to walk through. There has to be more of this in school. Well, I want to I hope we see more people with your attitude and your enthusiasm because it's infectious. Well, you know what? I think there are a lot of them, but you said it yourself. They're mired in their classrooms. I hope this book allows them to break free because I'm telling you, John, there are good teachers out there. I work with them. And if it doesn't work, they can smack the kids in the head with a book. <laughs> they could go to your priest. Yeah. <laughs> real talk. Real talk for real <laughs> teachers. Advice for teachers from rookies to veterans. No, don't hit the kids with the book. That's <laughs> missing the point. <laughs> Ray Fesquith joins us. Uh, have you got a cyber presence out there where we can uh, read I do. your musings um, regularly? HobartShakespeareans.org was created by two of my former students who are engineers from Berkeley. Yeah. And it's a great website, and you can see what the kids are up to. And the way a website should look, because I'm not on the website, it's all about the students and what they're up to. Well, we'll do just that and also see you tonight out at MICDS. Uh, Realtalk.brownpapertickets.com. I would recommend getting those ahead of time to make sure you can get in a 7 o'clock uh, talk and book signing. And uh, your entry fee also covers the cost of a book. What a pleasure. I wish you were my teacher. I'd have, I'd have a better job. Well, you wouldn't get hit as much. <laughs> that's, right. well, that's not so bad. You get used to it after a while. I think you do. Yeah, thanks so much. Enjoy your stay while you're John, here. John, thanks so much, man. All right, be well. 930.